Hey guys, welcome back to the Vice Casting Couch. Today we'll be installing Libreboot on our ASUS KGPE D16 server motherboard. Libreboot is a very interesting project and it's based on the Coreboot project, but they take it a step further. They remove any binary blobs and they disable the Intel management engine and the AMD platform security processor to make it as free and open source as possible. They also make pre-compiled ROMs for your motherboard. That way you don't have to compile it from scratch with the limited core boot documentation that's out there. Now, if you have the money, I'd strongly recommend getting the Raptor Engineering uh, Talos 2. It's probably the freest, most open source, um, high-end server and desktop workstation that's available nowadays. It, it comes spec'd out with PCI 4, DDR4. It has the Open Power 9 processor, which you can look at. All the schematics and firmware of this thing are out there to be looked at but it comes at a price and unfortunately these things cost about seven thousand dollars now we don't have seven grand so we're just going to go with the Libre Boot option as it helps accomplish the same goals as what the talos is trying to do you can often find these motherboards on ebay for about 200 to 250 dollars you can also get a pre-flashed bios chip with Libre Boot already installed so you don't have to go through this whole process we're about to endure if we go back to the Libre Boot documentation for this motherboard, we can see that Raptor Engineering has had a hand in this as well. Timothy Pearson over there is the one that ported Core Boot to this motherboard and ultimately allowed it to be supported by Libre Boot. If we keep scrolling through the documentation, we can see that it mentions the Opteron 6200 series are the most well supported for Libre Boot, as they have full IO MMU support, they work well with virtualization, and they don't require any microcode updates to run. So that's the processes we're going to be using today. When I bought my motherboard, it came with a pair of heat sinks and a pair of Opteron 6128s, which aren't, aren't as well supported. And we're going to replace those with the Opteron 6220s, which are eight cores, three gigahertz, and they will include all the hardware virtualization we want and the full IO MMU support that we're looking for. One thing to note here is that when you're removing the processors, you should be very careful of the socket as if you damage any of the pins in there, you could break your motherboard or you could run into some weird stability issues if it's not making full contact with the processor. I'm just removing the thermal paste here and we're going to remove it off the heatsink and apply some Arctic Silver MX4. I'm doing the line method as this will give us a better spread and coverage over our processors that they're quite long similar to the thread rippers of today. Once we get done, we're just going to screw those back down, make sure they're nice and tight and plug everything up. Here we're going to remove our BIOS chip, which we're going to flash Libre Boot onto. And I'm using a chip extractor here, but I ultimately think it's not entirely necessary, especially if your board is powered off and you're not hot swapping the BIOS chip. As long as you pull it out safely and don't damage the chip or the socket it sits in, it shouldn't be that big of an issue, so if you want to pass on getting it, that's up to you. This is just best practice. Here is the BIOS chip we'll be flashing Libreboot to. In Libreboot's documentation, they recommend not to use the CH341A flasher that we're going to use today. This is because it has 5 volts instead of 3.3. I've flashed this chip multiple times with this flasher and haven't noticed any issue, but it is something you should know if you're going to continue on with this. Now, when putting in the chip, you should be mindful there's a notch and there's a notch on the programmer and it tells you the orientation of how the chip should go in. Once it goes in, we'll lock it into place and we'll connect it up to our USB cable. If you don't want to use this flasher, you can use Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black, but we won't discuss that in this video as uh, we have this flasher on hand and that's what we're going to use. And from here, we're going to run the flash ROM program and we'll type in the command sudo flash ROM dash dash programmer and we'll specify our programmer, which is the ch341a underscore spi, and then we'll do dash r and name the file. So I'm just doing old dot bin and this allows us to save a backup of the file and also run this SHA-256 sum against it. And we can get a hash and verify that hash against multiple reads to ensure that we have a good connection to our chip and we have multiple backups that are all the same. And this will allow us to go back to the original BIOS if we ever had to for some reason. From here, we're just going to write the Libreboot ROM to the chip. We'll just change the dash R to a dash W and then point it at the Libreboot ROM that we downloaded from their website. From here, it'll erase and write it to the chip and verify that it wrote everything successfully. Now we'll just disconnect our flasher from our USB, unlock the chip and pull it out, and then we'll just put it in our motherboard. 
Here I'm just putting it in with my hands. Make sure to be mindful of the notch that is on the chip and on the socket. That way you know it's plugged in correctly. And we'll just plug it in, make sure everything's good, and try and fire up our machine and see if everything works. So I go to turn it on, I, I press the power on my power supply and give it a few seconds, but then I'm welcomed by this black screen and no post. Hello darkness, my old friend. So to try and find out what was happening and why it wouldn't post, I'm just going to connect a serial cable to my motherboard and then connect that to my USB serial adapter so we can see the output of Libreboot and hopefully figure out what's going on. Now from here we're just going to click serial, I'll point it at my USB to serial adapter, so TTY USB 0. It could be different for you, so make sure to look into that. Also there's the speed, we're going to change that to 115200 and we're gonna to go to logging. In logging, we're gonna make sure all session output is logged, and then we'll just call our log file libreboot, so that way we don't get confused. From here, it'll open up the window, and then we'll turn on our machine, and we should see a lot of output of the libreboot boot process, and hopefully, we can find out what's causing it to hang, maybe there's an issue with something we did, but as you can see, a lot of stuff will flash across the screen, and we'll just let it run for a minute or two and make sure our log file has all the information we'll, we'll possibly need to diagnose what's happening. So now we'll open up our log file and just skimming through it I found this line that says dim training failed restarting system and, and apparently was going through a boot loop and couldn't post. Opening up the core boot wiki that is retired it gained some more insight and figured out that the RAM training for core boot and ultimately Libre boot is not as mature as some of the stock BIOSes, so they're very finicky when it comes to RAM. So they do have an HCL list, but those lists only have revisions of motherboards of 1.03 and 1.04. But it says right here that depending on your PCB revision or the CPUs installed, you could run into different issues. So they also have a known bag config, so if you do have one of their motherboard revisions, you can look here and see if the RAM will work for you. So I ultimately made a throwaway Reddit account to initially ask for some help, but I was able to get my hands on a bunch of RAM to test out and I found some working configurations for a 1.05, which is the revision of motherboard that I have. I also posted some of the bag configs I found, so if you do have the same revision of motherboard as I do, you can know not to use those RAM modules. Because I had to replace the RAM anyway, I figured I might as well replace the noisy fans that came with my motherboard with some Noctua fans to help quiet everything down and make it more pleasant for my home lab. As you can see, those Noctua fans do a great job at quieting the whole system down. From here, I'm just going to install the whole motherboard into this 4U case that I found on Newegg. This was the cheapest case I could find that supports the EEB form factor which is very similar to EATX, it's just the mounting holes are, can be in slightly different spots. From here I'm just going to connect up all the fun stuff like the front USB headers and the front power switch and the hard drive activity indicator LED and all that stuff and we'll also connect up the two fans that came with the case as they're not too loud and they help increase airflow and will keep the whole system cool when we run it. From here we're just going to remove the RAM modules that were causing our boot loop before and replace them with the Hynix modules that I found worked well for this revision of motherboard and the selection of CPUs I'm using. After that, we're gonna start up our system one last time and make sure everything works. As you can see, C BIOS popped up and we can press escape to choose our boot menu. From here, I'm just running Memtest 86 to test my RAM. This is off of a flash drive. And one thing I've seen online is that people are complaining that they can't use their keyboard in that initial boot menu selection. I'd recommend using a PS2 keyboard if you have that issue. Sometimes USB keyboards don't work well in the BIOS if, if they can't initialize correctly. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you liked the video. Make sure to give us a thumbs up if you liked it. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. I'll try my best to respond to them. And make sure to subscribe to our channel. We have more interesting videos planned for the future. And see you guys next time.